we were discussing the Benoni who never sins, as every Benoni never sins, and also, oh, and also, and never is tempted to sin. But yet, even though he never sins and never is tempted to sin, he's not, in a sense of spiritual energy, considered much greater than the Benoni who's struggling constantly. It's really not. Because we said the reason why he's never tempted to sin is because of Tyra. His brain is saturated with Tyra. It's actually interesting. This is a reference today. I believe in today's Chitas, Tanya Chitas, to this concept of Tarasso um Naso. I could be wrong. It could have been yesterday. Um, maybe it was today. Tarasso um Naso. So a tzaddik who entirely, his whole devotion is to Tyra. And for a Benoni, there's such a concept as well, and that's called a Yoshev Oihel. Now, I should have said a few minutes ago, but I'd like to dedicate this class to a former student of mine from a different class, whose yard site is tonight, her first oh, yard site, Shimona Bas Ruvain. Mm -hmm. Anyone here knows or knew Sissy Kamish? Tonight's her first yard site. And um, I want to dedicate the class that our learning should help the elevation of her neshama. Amen. Amen. And Sissy definitely loved to learn. And definitely knew the power of Torah study. I'll say, um, as I leave for Nisham, I'll share a personal little vignette. So Sissy was very sick. She would come regularly to one of my classes, and then she got sicker, and she stopped coming. And I was thinking, what could I do for her? What could I do for her? You know, obviously, you said, I'm this and that. What could I do for her? I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I could offer to learn with her. But I was like, I don't know, you know, I know she's not well. I, I, I didn't want to impose. They wanted to make her feel uncomfortable. So, you know, like we, we, our brain tells us these things. We have a good idea and then our brain just, you know, we all know what I'm talking about, I assume. Anyway, <laughs> I did it. Steeled myself, picked up the phone, called, or maybe I sent a WhatsApp. And, um, and she said, oh my gosh, I'd love to learn with you. Uh, what had happened? She said that she was feeling really, really bad, like really down, really low, really very pessimistic about the whole situation, very weak, couldn't eat, like really bad situation. And she was speaking to a relative and friend of hers. And the woman said to her, well, you know why you feel this way? You feel this way because you're not learning Tyra. And you used to make sure to regularly learn. And because you learned, you had energy and you were optimistic and you were strong and you stopped learning. So that's why you feel this way. This was, um, the name, I mean, I know who she is, but I'm really bad with names. Um, this is Tainista. Her name just escapes me this second because I'm bad with names. Um, uh, you had to talk about your Mahatanis and Earth Yisrael, whose name I forget. Um, but, uh, um, what? Yeah, 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 Sarahana, yeah. Shifrahana, Shifrahana. Shifrahana, Shifrahana, exactly. Exactly, Shifrahana. Um, so she said, You've got to learn. If you learned, you, you, you'd feel good because you're not learning. That's why you feel like this. She's like, How can I learn? What can I learn? Anyway. Lo and behold, a few minutes later, or a short while later, I don't know how, long, how much later, I, with all of my hesitations, picked up the phone and called her and said, would you like to learn? So, um, yeah. Yeah. we were able to do it a few times before she wasn't able to do it anymore. Um, but I think that, that's sort of powerful now that I'm thinking of, of what happened there on, on, on her end and on my end. On, on my end, as you know, my end of the story, the lesson I took from it was like, don't make yourself crazy. Just do what you think is the right thing to do is the good thing to do. Go for it. Who knows? The other person could be in more receptive than you could ever imagine. And um, from her end, 
which is very, very relevant to the chapter of Tanya, or this, these, this section in the chapter of Tanya, it was that real sense of when I learn Torah, I have strength. And when I don't learn Torah, I'm really, really, really weak. And that's exactly what we're talking about now. Because this Benoni, because he's constantly learning Torah, he's so strong. He's so strong that his animal soul doesn't even have the ability to tempt him. So again, let's remind ourselves of the basics here. The animal soul of us <laughs> tempts, and if you want to say rarely, if you want to say often, everyone could fill in the adjective, uh, succeeds. The animal soul of the regular Benoni tempts and loses each time. Sometimes loses because the Benoni is strong enough to push him away. Sometimes loses because the Benoni has all the powers of the inspiration of his prayers of the morning. And sometimes loses because God steps in and helps. It always loses, but always tries. This level Benoni called a Yoshev Oihel. Yoshev Oihel again means one who sits in the tents. And the tents he sits in are the tents of Tyra. This level Benoni is not tempted. He's really strong, as we're saying. Tyra gives strength. He's really strong because he has Tyra in his head all the time. Um, and but, and we're up to the but of this concept, but that doesn't mean that his innate spirituality is stronger than a regular Benoni. Not necessarily. Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe his love and fear of God is no stronger. And that's really, in a sense, the, the measure of your spiritual energy. So it's not his own spiritual energy that's stifling the voice of his animal soul. It's Tyra's power. And as we said last week at Len, every one of us can open ourselves up to this power by absorbing Tyra, by taking in Tyra, by having our minds saturated with Tyra, we also have this power. Before going on to new that was reviewing the old, I'd also like to dedicate the class to Bracha's mother's yard site. Bracha, her yard site is Ches, correct? Yes. Yes. Sivya Bas Michael. Sivya Bas Michael. I'm sure she's very, very, very high and I'm sure is ascending even higher. And obviously everything happening with all of her children and grandchildren and great grandchildren and Gervais Mare is uh, amazing. I am Nitzchim for her even right now. Thank you. So hopefully the Embracha will share something with us, hopefully. Um, and it's Tess Kislev. So we have the Mithlerub's energy. So a, a lot of great, great powers now. All right, so we are on. It's my anical, it's my anical dive bear Lipschitz's birthday. That's how he how got dive bear. Eight. Tess or Fess? Tess. Tess, Mazel Tov. Dive bear, okay, that's appropriate, okay. appropriate. He got the right name. Yeah. Could he get a girl? Could have been, uh, but no, he got dive bear. Okay. All right, so we are eight lines from the bottom of page 36, the other side of page Yud Ches. And what we said was that in a regular person, including a regular Benoni, which this Yoshev Oihel falls under that category, despite all of the Torah that's constantly in his brain, there's always this dynamics, this yo-yo, Seesaw. Seesaw is better than yo-yo. Effect between godliness and evil. We said this was based on the verse that Rivka received prophetically concerning the, the, the what's this crazy child inside of her. And she was told, no, you don't have one crazy child. You've got two. Two nations. They'll be diametrically opposed. And when one goes up, the other goes down. And when one goes up, the other goes down. Um mel um yemats. Kishazekam zenofel. Kishazekam when this one goes up, this goes down. And when this one goes up, and the altar of does not conclude that saying of the sages because he doesn't want to say, God forbid, that we go down, but that's the implication. So that's true for all of us. We all have these two powers inside of us. It's cosmically, it's globally, and it's inside every one of us on a very, very personal level. Sorry, I just want to... 
get off my phone so that nothing happens again. Um, so inside this Benoni, there are still those two nations warring. He's perfect. True. In everything he does. Absolutely. Everything he says. You're right. Everything he thinks. Mm -hmm. And he's not tempted at all. Yes. And there are still two nations warring inside of him. Yeah, there are still two nations warring inside of him. As crazy as that sounds, that someone is perfect in everything he does, perfect in everything he says, perfect in everything he consciously thinks, and is not even being tempted, yet still, the powers are there inside of him. Right now, they're latent. Right now, they're subdued. Right now, the only thing you see is the godly. But that other power is there completely intact. Ul'um, mil'um, ye'emats. And they're in, they'll be in deadlocked warfare. Kishazek comes in Ophel. Right now, the godly is very dominant, so the evil has been knocked to the earth, not to the dust. But if he stops learning, if he would stop his absolute commitment, it could go the other direction. So the Rebbe continues to say, the Rebbe continues to say, so again, we're about, I counted it for you before, eight lines from the bottom, page 36. So the godly soul is striving, is working very, very, very hard to overcome the animal from the source of strength, which is Bina, which is found within contemplation. Very interesting. The Rebbe is sort of throwing a lot of different ideas here. So let's understand a little bit the dynamics of our soul to understand what the Rebbe is saying here. We have 10 soul powers on each level. We have five levels of soul, and on each level there's 10 soul powers. The soul powers are organized, if you'd like to envision them this way, in three triangles. And there's, and there's a lot of relationships going on. There's a relationship within the, the triangle. <laughs> the first three have a certain relationship, Chachma Bina Das. The second three, Chasigur Tiferes. And the final three, Netzach Each triangle is an intact unit that has a relationship. There's also an alignment. I'd love a blackboard here, sorry. An alignment an alignment on the parallel levels, which means, hopefully I'll just say this in my brain at the same time, Chachma, Bina, Das, Chesed, Gevura, Tiferes. So Chachma and Chesed are in alignment, as is Netzach. Bina and Gevura are in alignment, as is Hoid. Netzach is the minor image of Chesed. Hoid is the minor image of Givura. But it even goes back to the antecedents of the intellect, which means Chesed is in alignment with Chachma. This is all the male side. And Givura is in alignment with Bina, the feminine side. So here we have the godly soul pulling on her strength. Well, strength is Gevura. Gevura is strength. Again, we can think of Gevura as self-discipline. Uh, one could think of it in terms of God's Gevura as a, as a punitive element. But bottom line, Gevura is our strength. So here we have this war between the godly and the animal. It's a deadlocked war. And therefore, the godly soul needs to create a force that will be powerful enough to overcome the animal. So she needs strength. So sort of the dichotomy of thought here is she's creating a love. Well, love, I think of as chesed, right? I have chesed, that's kindness, that's loving, that's giving. I have gevura, that's strength, that's restraint, that's fear element. But if I want a really strong love, I want a love that's sourced in gevura. We might call today a tough love. Now, what is Gevura parallel to? What's the antecedent of Gevura on that side of the column? 
Bina. We have Chachma, the flash. That's like the, the male energy. We have Bina, the contemplation, the analysis, the introspection, the female energy. Chachma is expressed in the Chesed, in the giving. Bina is expressed in the Gevura, in the withholding, is the strength. So here the godly soul wants a really strong love, so she's going to the other side. She's not going to the side of love. She's going to the side of strength. And she's going to elicit that strength to the source of strength. Because again, chesed, love, gvura, normatively fear. What we're using here is strength. Chachma, bina. So she's going to use her faculty of bina to access her gvura. She's going, you could really share a screen here. I should probably do that. She's going to contemplate, to meditate, to introspect on godliness. Because the more she invests herself intellectually in deep thought on God, the more what's coming out is going to have the colors of gvura, which is, means by nature is going to be very, very, very strong. It's a love. That's chesed. No, but this is a gvura love. Because this is a really strong love. It's not, in other words, normatively we think of love as water. Water flows down. Water is peaceful, is calm, is tranquil, is nourishing. That's love. But very often in Tanya, we speak of a different type of love. And we speak of a fiery love. A love like fire. That's not really the color and flavor of love. Fire withdraws, fire moves away from you, fire goes up, love should be coming to you. But this is a fire-like love because it's not coming from the chesed, it's not coming from the kind, giving energies. It's coming from the strength of your soul. And we access this strength by using our mind and contemplating, deeply thinking into God that through our thoughts is formed a love, which of course we've been learning throughout the first 17 chapters of Tanya, through your thoughts are formed a love, but a very strong love, a love that's gvura. Why do we need such a strong love? Because I just said, um, um, yeah, there's a war going on here. There's a battle. There's a fight. So when you feel you're being threatened, as we probably sometimes do, we need to find that we're very strong people. We all have enormous power. And the Rebbe is giving us the key how to unlock that power. Use your mind. Think about God in your mind from the bina to access the gvura, from the thoughts to access the strength of your soul to produce an energy strong enough to blow away this other side. That's the technique. That's the tool. It works for all of us, as we're saying here. All of these tools are not only for the benoni or for the yashayvayal benoni, this is for every one of us. Every one of us could fill our mind with Tyra and be so strong over the evil inside of us. Every one of us can contemplate deeply on Hashem to access strength, an energy that's so strong that it will overcome the other side. That's what the Rebbe is saying here. The godly soul is pulling it very strongly to overcome the animal soul in the source of strength, which is Bina, as we now understand those words, to deeply contemplate the greatness of God in its infinity, all the way to the top, going all the way to infinity, and to produce, the godly soul wants something to come out of this, Ahava Aza, a very strong love, not just a love. Love is chesed. This is a love from Gvura, because this is a very, very, very strong love, Lashem to God. Kirishre ish, like flaming fire, right? So again, chesed, kindness, loving kindness is always symbolized by water, the downward giving flow. Gvura is always symbolized by fire, that which is retreating, holding back. Like Gvura is the energy of holding back, of self restraint, of self discipline. But here, we're crossing it because it's a love like fire. It's a fiery love. It's from the side of Gevura. It's very, very powerful, like a mother's love because this is the woman's side. So women's love is very, very powerful because it's a woman's love. 
So you've got the gvura element, as we are gvura, you have the gvura element within this love. Fiery love on the right side of the heart, where of course is the side of the godly soul. Shebelibo of his heart, but us, and then Iskafia Sitra Achra Shebechalal Hasmali. That fiery love crushes the evil in the left side. We can do this. We can empower evil. We can crush evil. We can inflate it. We can deflate it. So the creation of this love automatically deflates the powers takes back all those powers that the animal was pulling from us because the animal survives on our energy. And when I'm really, really focused, I'm really, really present, I'm really, really strong, I'm not giving it these energies. Shh. She's deflated. She's got nothing left. Because she's got nothing of her own. She's just a facade. She's just pulling on our energies. But even so, by the Benoni, how do you contemplate it and went for the Gvura and produced an intense fire like love and deflated your animal? It's still there. It's very deflated, but it's still there because the only one that can destroy that animal. Well, we don't even really want to destroy the animal. That, that's a misnomer. The only one that can destroy the evil inclination and therefore transform his animal and have his animal be serving God fused with the godly is the tzaddik. So we can anticipate looking forward to that experience by Mashiach when all of us will have absolutely no evil and what will happen to our animals They'll be fused with their godly and serving God with all the energy of the animal, which is a really strong energy. So it'd be really amazing powers. I feel so awake and alive and functioning. Because it says about the Tzad Diction, So this verse from Tehillim, from Psalms, is one of the verses that discriminate between a tzaddik and everyone else. Now, the disclaimer here is that the Lubavitcher Rebbe said in 1991 that every one of us has the potential to become a complete tzaddik as the Tanya understands a complete tzaddik. Traditional Hasidus, until 1991, viewed the tzaddik as a person who came down with a special different type of soul. The soul that had the potential or was actualized as a tzaddik. But if it's actualized or potential, the tzaddik soul has a different ability, both in terms of godliness and evil, than everyone else. So here this Benoni that we're talking about, Rabbi Benoni under contemplation here, or Rebetzin Benoni under contemplation here, is perfect in everything he or she does, says, thinks, feels is not struggling at all because Tyra is constantly flooding the brain, but yet could not destroy the evil one drop. Could not destroy that evil energy of the Yetzirah at all. The evil inclination is completely intact. As we'll learn later in Tanya, we are able to transform bit by bit the impurities of our animal because our animal is an evil we can change. But the evil inclination we can't touch at all. The tzaddik has the power to destroy his evil inclination. How can he destroy his evil? What destroys evil? The same process we're saying now, but the tzaddik can just do it on a much higher level, like much more empowered. So the tzaddik has an intensity of love for God we cannot experience if we're not a tzaddik. The intensity of love creates an intensity of hatred, of despising evil. The more you love God, the more you despise and hate evil. The tzaddik is full of hatred for evil. As King David said in Psalms and Tehillim, Taklas sinas and asim, lo'ivim hayuli, hakrani vidal I hate them absolutely. 
I hate all this evil. Absolutely, God, if you want to see, check my heart. My heart is so full of love for you. Therefore, it's so full of hatred for anything that blocks you and obstructs you in this world. And therefore, I absolutely hate evil. And since the evil is absolutely hated, he doesn't energize it. Well, if you don't energize it, it doesn't exist. Because the evil exists from our energy. We energize evil. We energize the evil in the world. We energize the evil inside ourselves. God gives it a very minimal life. All of its grandiose powers come from us because we believe in it, because we fear it. I had a very interesting example yesterday um, in the, the Jewish history class. They're talking, I'm not going to the whole historical thing, but it's just such an obvious example of this, of the time of Herod. And um, when he began his horrific career, he began by killing out many, many, many Jews. And the people appealed to the king, Horkinus, who, I'm not going to give you all these historical details, but he called him in, and Herod strode in with these like regal rolls and a whole battalion of soldiers. And all the sages that were supposed to judge him were like scared. Well, I'm going to judge him, like, come on, who are we fooling? And they sort of shrunk back and didn't do anything, except for one sage, Shammai. Of course, we know of Shammai, Hillel and Shammai, but this time he was, he was a, the younger kid on the block, so he wasn't as famous. But Shammai stood up, and he had no fear of Herod. And he said to all the sages, I mean, basically, I'm playing my own words, like, what, what's your issue? You're going to be scared of him. Guess what? He's going to kill you, and he's going to kill the king. He's going to kill all of you. Well, what are you fearing him for? And the sages were strengthened by Shammai's words, but whatever, life continued, and Herod escaped. He escaped from Israel. He was outside of Israel for six years. When he came back six years later with a whole army and took over the country, he killed out every single sage that was at that council that in the end said he was supposed to be killed, except one. Who was the one sage he couldn't touch? Shammai. He also eventually killed the king, Hyrcanus, as well. He didn't touch Shammai. Oh, maybe, you know, uh, maybe on his mental level, he had political considerations, you know, he didn't want to start up with the people too much, Shammai was very po popular, but we see he had no compunctions of murdering, torturing, and burning alive many, many, many people. So it seems a little strange that he suddenly didn't want to touch Shammai, he was scared of the popular reaction. But on, on, a, on a Kabbalistic, Hasidic level, it's so obvious. Shammai didn't give him any energy. Shammai didn't give him any of his fear. He couldn't touch him at all. So we really empower the evil inside of us by believing in it and fearing it and stressing over it. The tzaddik, such love of God, therefore such hatred of evil, therefore it can't exist inside of him. And that's why King David said it to Hillam in Psalms, Lili bi halal bakirbi. My heart is empty inside of me. It's a void. Because what's supposed to be there pulsating on the left side of my heart, all that animal energy, all the energy of the evil inclination is gone. There's no more evil inclination. And the animal soul has become fused with the godly. It's gone. That's what a tzaddik can do and a regular person can't. And therefore, the altar is bringing this in to say that even this person who's so great, who learns Tyra all the time, who has such power of Tyra inside of him, who's consistently winning the war but the evil is still inside of him only the tzaddik can destroy the evil inclination and therefore only in the tzaddik can the animal soul actually be fused with the godly and serving hashem uh rabbit center I, ha I have a question though sure um what, couldn't you argue that king david like his his animal soul was definitely very active <laughs> according to what no. we can see in his life no not at all no not at all anything you're you're thinking of is all misunderstanding. And um, even the Talmud says, Kol David chata eno Anyone who said David sinned is making a mistake. That there's, there's, there's no concept, really. The truth is, again, to understand it, a tzaddik can't sin. Meaning, it's almost like he doesn't have that ability. Could a tzaddik choose the wrong godliness yeah if god wants him to he could he could make a wrong choice if god is pulling him to make that wrong choice because he's going to mirror what god wants of him 
And sometimes God leads us to make mistakes, but he can't sin because he doesn't have that faculty. I mean, this is what I'm saying on a soul level, we have a godly soul, we have an animal soul, and we have an evil inclination. And the evil inclination is master over the animal soul. The animal soul is sort of like nebulous energy, traditionally under the rule of the evil inclination, but it could, in the tzaddik, be fused with the godly. But what's ruling the animal, for the rest of us, is the evil inclination. The definition of the tzaddik, the discrimination between a tzaddik and a benoni, or anyone else, benoni being the highest, highest, highest level a human can get who's not a tzaddik, is the destruction of evil. To be any type of tzaddik, you have to have already begun the process of destroying the evil. An incomplete tzaddik has begun the process to the degree that at least one sixtieth of his evil inclination is gone. The perfect tzaddik, the difference between incomplete and perfect, is that there's no evil left at all. The second there's no evil left, his animal soul is fused with his godly and empowers his godly in serving God. King David was from the five greatest souls of all times. I think when we look at him and look at many other people actually historically, you just see him less than other people. There's certain people that I look at and I think, wow, they got such a bad rap and the rap still continues till today. Like um, Aaron's sons, right? Such a bad rap. The rap still continues till today and learn it Kabbalistically or through Hasidus and they were the greatest of the greats. Actually, it says in Torah as well. It's just sort of not understood in Torah. Rashi himself, the commentator on the literal meaning of the verse says they were holier than Moshe and Aaron. But it doesn't make a difference. Nobody remembers that. They still have a, tr a, a bad rap till today. So King David also. King David was from the five holiest souls that ever lived. He was the, there are five levels of soul and there's one, comprehensive soul for each of the five levels. And David was the comprehensive soul of our nefesh, of our first level of soul, which means within each one of us in the core of that level is a spark of him. And all of us are contained in his soul in the level of nefesh. Mm -hmm. And therefore anything written there, you need to study it really deeply to understand what was exactly going on. And I'm not saying it's simple but it was actually all coming from a person that didn't have an evil inclination. And the same, and the same thing with, um, with Moshe, with Moses, when he hit the rock and anything in Abraham, Yitzhak and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, anything that we read that seems to imply they sinned, it's not even possible. It's not even in the gamut of possibility because they've destroyed the evil, so there's no possibility left of sin. Does anyone else have a question? I'm glad Irella asked something. This was a really long monologue. So, um, so the Rebbe, you said that the Rebbe said, um, we're, all, we're all supposed to be tzaddikim. Potential. Now, when Mashiach comes, or we can start to tap into the Rebbe said in 1991 in Shabbos Parshas Emor of 1991 that today, because the energies have shifted, because we're so close to Mashiach, so like the a lot of things that how they traditionally were have changed. Uh, one very strong one being that the Rebbe says that all of the energy of Mashiach is already in this world. So that's right away a fundamental change. I don't see it, but it's here. And therefore it's affecting us. So one, like another basic change that the Rebbe speaks of in, in other talks is traditional Tanya, traditional Hasidus, only a very great person could attempt the higher level repentance, tshuva me'ahava, the repenting from love. According to the Rebbe, every one of us can do it now. I highly recommend everyone to do it. How can we do it? We you think we're greater than we are? The Rebbe says we are. We have that energy because Mashiach's energy is in the world. So similarly with this concept, traditionally, there's a soul prototype tzaddik. And if you don't have that soul, you can never be a tzaddik, basically. We're going to learn at the end of chapter 14, one exception to the rule. But generally, you can never be a tzaddik. Now the Rebbe says, because there's such energy in this world, all of us can access that energy to truly ascend to becoming a tzaddik. So I'm not saying the Rebbe says you have to be a tzaddik and you're at fault if you're not a tzaddik. 
The Rebbe is saying you have the ability to be a tzaddik. And, Thank and you. It, sure. That's and again, for all of us, it's just, it's like if we only knew what we were capable of. So a lot of times we're scared to know what we're capable of because that um, obligates. Like who wants to know they're more capable than they are? We're overloaded as it is. So we got to shift our brains to, to celebrate and embrace power instead of saying, no, no, don't tell me I have more ability. I don't want to hear about it. We're supposed to like celebrate it, embrace it and, and use it. But yes, absolutely. Wow. Wow. Any other questions? Okay, so let's keep going. Again, you can ask a question, you can chat a question, you can chat a question to me personally. Um, is it possible respond? that, respond. yeah, from a, is it possible that the rebel was just sort of opening up this reality that we are that generation? going to experience the ga'ula that we could already open ourselves up to that reality that we will all be tzaddikim that it's not like something that isn't attainable because we're so so close to being there is that a possibility um it could be maybe maybe it's a a juxtaposition of both meaning what i'm hearing you saying is that maybe the rebbe's words were said to create the opportunity instead of informing us of the opportunity. And I think it sort of makes sense what we're saying because we say an instruction gives strength. If a tzaddik tells us to do something, by definition, he's giving us the power to do it. So if the Rebbe is informing us of a reality, he's also empowering and helping that reality be. Maybe, maybe it's a combination of both. Maybe it's a bit of what was and a bit of the Rebbe's pushing it in a certain direction by these words. That, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um. Anyone else? Any other questions? I know I throw you a lot of information. Um, okay, so going on. Who moye spara? The tzaddik despises evil, meaning. I don't think we have to give us a lesson on ourselves. We know ourselves. We're attracted to evil. Sometimes we succumb and sometimes we overcome, but we're definitely attracted. The holier you are, the higher you ascend, a lot of evil repels you, but there's still that piece that attracts you. Doesn't mean you succumb to it, but it still attracts you. So therefore the classical work of the regular prototype Jew is to crush his desire for evil. We want it and we can't have it. We want it and we're not going there, which of course Kabbalistically is called iskafia, which is from the root word kfia, crushing, suppressing. The tzaddik, what did we just read? Hu spara. He despises it. It's sort of like, if you can envision the regular Jew that messes up sometimes is like, oh my gosh, I want it and I did it. And the Bainerni would be like, you did it? I would never do it, but I sure can relate to wanting it. And the tzaddik is, you want it? Why would you want something like that? <laughs> it's disgusting. Uh, for those of you that know the the famous story, I believe with the Rebbe Maharaj, but I'm pretty bad with names and stories of how he was literally physically sweating after a night of personal audiences. And when he was asked, why was he so physically sweating? He said, what do you think I do in a personal audience? I have to take off my clothing, get dressed in the other person's clothing to understand them. Then I have to take off their clothing and put on my clothing to be able to help them. And back and forth and back and forth and back and forth all night long. Of course I'm sweating. 
So this, this, is, this is truly for the tzaddik to get our space. He has to get dressed in our clothing. Because on his level, who might spara? It's like, ugh, this is evil. Obviously, we can look at a, a bin Laden or Saddam Hussein and think, ugh, evil, repulsive. But we can look at a, I don't know, many of the pleasures and indulgences of this world that we're not supposed to have and be like, ooh, that looks really good, but I'm not going to do it. And the tzaddik looks at all of these things and he's disgusted. Why? What's disgusting him? It's awesome. It's great. We just know how to do it. Because it's a barrier to God. And because all that tzaddik wants is Hashem. That's his whole reality. So anything that's a barrier is, is the opposition, disgusts him. And he truly mirrors God. And just as God hates evil, so does the tzaddik. It's intuitive. And again, because of this intense hatred of it, therefore, it cannot exist inside of him. So he absolutely hates it and is absolutely disgusted with it. Oh, or perhaps. Maybe he's an imperfect tzaddik and therefore he imperfectly hates it and therefore he imperfectly despises it. But it's still strong enough to begin the process of destruction of the evil, but it's not strong enough to eradicate it completely. Meaning 100% love, 100% hatred and disgust, 100% removal of evil. The imperfect tzaddik, 99 point something percent love and therefore hatred and despising and therefore a certain percentage of removing evil and each side to for where he's holding and again this is this is something we're all going to experience we're going to all love on this level we're going to all hate evil of course there won't be any evil around so we won't have really a target for the hatred but the concept of evil will be will be feeling as god does hatred of that which is a barrier to him which is an obstruction to his presence in this world evil Any questions? Any any thoughts on any of this? Um, sorry. <laughs> I guess I I <laughs> I welcome it. Trust me, Arella. I don't mind okay. at all. What is everyone else? Because everyone has questions, but they just can't be bothered. So let, let let's hear something. Okay, so I guess I would, I'd want to understand like how the Tanya exactly defines evil because from what I understood at least, there's like I don't know about how you call it evil, but there's the concept of like things. There's certain things that have so many klipot that it obstructs. The inner, es- the inner holy essence that actually is there that you just can't see it. Okay. And it just sounds like a very black and white way of thinking that it's like evil as opposed to like, just like, I don't know, can you elevate it? Like, is there such a thing, as, is there really such a thing as like, you cannot elevate it at all? I thought there was just like many. So there's, so there's two, there's two types of evil, right? I'm using the word in English. I'm using the word loosely evil. Kabbalistically, there's the level we call Klippos Timaeus which has three levels, three levels of impure shells, husks, covering over God's energy, and klipas noiga. Klipas noiga is a shell, a husk, a klipa. That's noiga. Noiga, there's a translucence because the light can shine through the klipa, right? So everything in this world that's not holiness, that's not kedusha, is some level of klipa, like my cell phone. Okay, this is klipa, because it's not kedusha, and it's either kedusha or klipa. When it's energized by klipa, though, it's energized by the level called klipas noiga, a husk, a shell around the godly energy that is this, but it's a permeable shell, like an apple peel. I can bite through it, and I can access it, and hopefully I do and use this for many good things. Hopefully it's very elevated over the process. That's klipa snaiga, as is the, the, the example that's most significant to us is our body and our animal soul. Our body is klipa snaiga energy. Our animal soul is klipa snaiga energy. Can I access the noga within the klipa? Absolutely. That's the purpose of my existence in this world. And then there's klipa's tomatoes. Klipa's tomatoes also are covering over godliness because if it wasn't godly, it wouldn't be. But if you would take a crime, you would take gossip, slander, stealing, or an object that's forbidden, like a cheeseburger, or pork, or moving a pen on Chavez. Any of those things are all energized by Klippus Tomatoes. 
Klipas Timaeus meaning, is there godliness there? Of course, otherwise it wouldn't be. Nothing can be. The only matter of existence is godliness. But it's a godliness that's inaccessible. And that's the idea of like a walnut shell that you can't try to crack it with your teeth. You'll break the teeth, not the shell. Or like a wall versus a window. So truly, by Mashiach, when all the klipot are gone, that's, it's, that's in the Talmud, the, the name in Hebrew for pig is Chazir. And in the Talmud, it says, why is it called Chazir? Because by Mashiach, it will lachzar. It will return back. It will be kosher. Why will it be kosher? Because the klipa is gone. Once the shell is gone, the godliness is shining. What's there between that and a cow? So I'll be able to utilize it directly to serve God. Now, I'm not saying therefore everything in the world will be kosher. We can assume, perhaps, we don't know. The Talmud says it's specifically about the pig. That specifically it's called the chazer because in the future it will chozer. It's going to go back because the klipa will be gone. So do we look at things as potential? Anything of klipa snoiga, we are, that's our arena. That's why we're in this world. So klipa snoiga is anything that is not forbidden and not godly. Most of your world is klipa snoiga. The high majority of your world is not forbidden and is not godly. If you look around your room, I would just imagine everything in your room is going to fall into that category almost, besides a holy book. You know what I'm saying? Besides a mezuzah. It's not forbidden and it's not godly. What does that mean? It means it's my opportunity to shift it from klipas noiga to godliness, to kedusha. That's my challenge. That's my opportunity. And again, most specifically myself, my body and my animal soul, I want to shift from klipas noiga to godly. But anything that's klipas Timaeus, I serve it by negation. I don't eat the horse meat to have the energy to serve Hashem. Because if I ate the horse meat and was so empowered and prayed and studied and did all these great acts, I didn't move it one iota. I don't have the ability to. So until Mashiach comes, that energy is stuck. The only way I somewhat refine it is when I'm challenged and don't give in. So the energy of gossip, okay? Gossip is evil. So if I'm challenged to gossip and don't, then I'm actually to a certain degree lessening the intensity of that evil. Of course, there's me lessening the intensity of the evil and the rest of the world gossiping, so I don't know if it's gonna be, you know. But that's spiritually what's happening. So therefore, sometimes God temp tempts us. God tempts us with things that are like, what are you putting me through this for? Because I know you're really powerful. And because I need this evil to get lessened. And if you're tempted and don't give in, you are lessening the intensity of the power of that evil, of that klipa, klipas Timaeus. But that's all you can do. That's the only way you can refine it is by negation. But klipas noiga, yes, that's the arena of opportunity. Any other questions? Okay. So moving on. Of all the Benoni, so the Tzaddik has this ability to absolutely love and therefore absolutely hate and therefore absolutely destroy. But the Benoni, who derech marshal ka'adam sheyashen. The evil inside of him is like someone sleeping. Sheyachol lachs over the oil. Mishay naso. He could return. He could wake up. Even in such a perfect person, even if he's been quiet for the past 30 years, he could wake up. There's always that possibility. If you could think of a, an alcoholic who hasn't taken a drop for 30 years, he's an alcoholic who hasn't taken a drop for 30 years. So the Benoni in potential could fall. He hasn't fallen for the past 30 years, but he could. The potential always exists inside of him. So to the evil in the Benoni is sleeping on the left side. During, as we said, we already spoke about this in chapter 12, during the time of Shema and Shemona Esrei, when the godly energy is very, very intense. That his heart is burning. It's on fire, as we discussed today. A love that's fire, a love that's really, really strong. But afterwards, it could wake up. Any other questions? 
we could go on. We can stop at this point if I don't have any questions. Okay, so what the Rebbe is leading to now is the next level of Benoni. So in this chapter, we're sort of sketching out the Benonim. We're being very simplified because I told you the Altar says there are 500 levels of Benonim. And in time there, we're going to meet about 20. But in this chapter, we're really speaking about three. The regular Benoni, who is struggling and only survived by God's help. The Yoishev Ayel, who is not spiritually, in terms of his own godly energy, so different from the regular one, but he's absolutely empowered and never struggles because Torah is strengthening him and squashing the evil. And what we'll discuss now. The now, the next level Benoni, the term we're going to give him is Benoni Hamispalel Kol Hayom, which translates to mean a Benoni who prays all day long. Now, he does not pray all day long. So why do we call someone someone who prays all day long if he doesn't? Because we just explained that the Benoni during prayer is different than the rest of the day. And we discussed this at length in chapter 12, that when the Benoni prays, he's has a totally different type of love going on, of what we call an avasichli, an intellectually created love, very, very powerful. His evil is completely knocked out. It exists, but completely knocked out, totally sleeping inside of him, cannot wake up because the energy of God is way too powerful. There are some bane on him that live like this all day long. So they're called a bane who davens all day, a bane who prays all day, not because they pray all day but because their level of relationship to Hashem is as if they were davening all day. They have that intense love for Hashem. And with this, we can answer a question we raised in chapter one of Tanya. Because in chapter one, I told you we're going to begin answering the questions from chapter one. Look, it took us till chapter 13 to begin answering them, and quite a number we're going to answer in chapter 14. And the final one, I believe we answered in chapter 27. But what was one of the classical questions of chapter one of Tanya? That Rabba, who was the leader of his generation, the holiest tzaddik from all the tzaddik of his generation, when he was teaching his students what means a benoni, he said, Kigon on a benoni. I'm a benoni. Of course, his students said, No way. If you're a benoni, we're dead. If you're a benoni, we all must be very evil. But he meant it. Now, was he a benoni? No. He was a tzaddik. As I just said, Tzadikun can make mistakes if God wants them to make mistakes. So he was a Tzadik. But he was making a mistake and thinking he was a Benoni. But the question is, how did he make such a mistake? Like, you don't walk outside at 8 o'clock at night in Chicago and make a mistake and say, oh, it's broad daylight outside. Like, how do you make a mistake and think you're struggling all the time when actually you don't struggle at all and the evil has no voice inside of you and the evil is actually completely gone? Rob is a complete Tzadik. He completely destroyed his evil. His animal soul is serving his godly soul. Therefore, he doesn't struggle at all with evil. And a Benoni struggles all the time, but never gives in. So how do you think he was a Benoni? Here's the answer. Because there could be a Benoni so connected to God that he doesn't struggle at all. Not because he's learning Torah all day long. We said that's a specialized soul only for a person who that's their job in this world. Because for most of us, it's not our job in this world. Not because he's learning Torah all day long, but because of the intensity of love he has for God. His love for God is so powerful. It's as powerful as during his prayers. And therefore, he has the benefits of the love, which means his evil is completely suppressed. Not suppressed like the Yosef Oyel by his Torah, literally suppressed by his own energies, by his own intense love of God. Such a banony, even for the person, could be viewed as a subject. He's loving God. He's hating evil. He doesn't hear its voice at all. Is he a tzaddik? No, he's a very, very high banony. There's higher. We're going to learn like a chapter of even higher banony than this. He's a very, very high banony. But such a tzaddik with absolute humility could think, eh, who said I'm a tzaddik? Maybe I'm that type of Benoni that it's as if he davens all day long. Okay, to be continued, we'll continue this next week. Um, but this is this new level of Benoni that we're about to discuss. We're going to discuss that.
And then we're going to discuss a very interesting concept until the end of the chapter, which is the idea of truth and how truth is and isn't, so to speak, relative, as, as we'll discuss at the end of this chapter. Um, Bracha? Can you share with us something? Uh, yeah. Um, I would say something that my mother always um, did every day is giving stucco. She was very careful to give stuck every day. So in order to be just very practical, she had like a container of a bunch of little coins. So this way, every day, she didn't have to look for places to get the money, but she had the coins and she could give stuck every day. And that's what we took from her also. Um, though she was from the previous generation, she was also careful with davening. Which was not very usual, but I guess she was one girl among four boys, and when the Malamed came home to teach the boys, she wanted to join, so she learned stuff from them. Um, in the cellar? And it wasn't in the cellar, it was in the house. They didn't have to go in the cellar. I mean, at different times they had to run away, but at that point they didn't have. But they, it was in the house, and they had to go to different places or they changed their names, belonging to different, their last name. Um, also, she told me some, she did something kind of practical. I don't know if it happens to anyone, but sometimes when you're very busy and you finish eating, you can not be sure if you benched or didn't bench. So I remember my mother used to eat like crackers, it was called uh, like biscuit, and he makes like little crumbs. And whenever she benched, she used to make like a little pile of the of the crumbs on the table. And I once asked her, why are you making a little pile of the crumbs? And she said, because she's so busy doing this and that, that when she finishes eating and she benches, sometimes afterwards, she doesn't remember if she benched or not. So she would make a little pile of the crumbs. So this way, when she comes back, if she sees the pile, <laughs> then she remembers that she benched. It's a great tip. And... <laughs> I think it happens that sometimes we say brachis in the morning and we don't remember if we say brachis. Or we say bayna fashis or we say benching and we run around because we're busy and we forget. So just to make ourselves some kind of semen, some kind of sign to remember it. And um, we lived in France in the yeshiva, so my mother was very busy with helping, especially the Bochim, if they didn't feel good or whatever, so she was there to help them. She was kind of the ambite of the yeshiva, unofficially, but she became one. So I'm sharing that, and anything that a person does, Le'ilu Nishmas, is always good. Beautiful. So thank you for dedicating the class, and Hana Shalom should have an alien. Very, very, very beautiful. Very beautiful. I like the, the idea of the simon for the benching because yes, I'm definitely one of those people that like, did I make a brain of fascist? Did I not? Did I make? Did I not? <laughs> so I, I hope I'll, I hope I'll figure out a good simon if that's if a great idea. Um, I think it's it's a hard one. It's, now it's maybe a little easier, but when the kids were little, it was even harder because sometimes you don't even finish eating because somebody needed this and then you have to put the kids to bed and you forget that you didn't finish eating and you forget that you didn't bench. And it was just a very practical semen, but it doesn't have to be this semen. What it teaches is a person sees that there is a problem, then do a concrete solution. Beautiful. And I'm sure she has such an achas from her and her children. And grandchildren and great grandchildren. It's the most valuable, precious thing there is, and she has it. I would also say in Russia, I remember that, I mean, I remember I was never there. I remember telling that she told me that at a certain point she had to take a train to go to the Mikva, and the train was 12 hours each way. I mean, the trains go a little slow maybe in Russia, but in any case, that means that she had to take a 12-hour train, sleep over in a different place, go to a mikvah that was underground, meaning that it was dangerous to get there because it was illegal. So you had to go to different 
contact. And then the next day, she had to take another train to come back. So whenever we can do the mitzvah, to know how precious it is and how important it is and how the Rebishter cares for me, because it actually brings a Kedusha to the world. It's the, at this point in, in um, in Golos, we do not have a Tahar, we don't have the Torah Duma, we cannot be pure. A certain measure of purity is still attained by going to the mikvah. And we have even the opportunity to say Broche, which men don't. So whenever we go, we should realize that it's actually bringing a purity into the world. Mm. What else did she tell you that's so inspiring? What else did she share with you? I mean, it's, it's the general appreciation of the opportunity of being able to do a mitzvah. And, you know, it, it happens that we take it for granted, but because Baruch Hashem Take, we have it. It's the dedication, even that's for Chol of Israel. When we were in France, we didn't have milk on the shelf. So every morning, somebody had to go to the farm and the milking of the cows was around 5, 6, 5, 30 in the morning. Watch the milking of the cow and then close the containers. And then we didn't have a car, so we had to take a taxi to bring the milk and share it with all the, the families that live there in order to have Chalav Israel. So cheese didn't, we didn't have cheese or any kind of milk things, unless what we got from Switzerland, some little cheeses sometimes. But otherwise, that's how we got the milk every morning and we boiled it and that's the milk we had. And the point was that it came out more expensive, meaning you have to schlep and do all this. But for cash, so for a mitzvah, nothing else counts. As long as we can get it, then we do it. So now, Baruch Hashem, it's just on the shelf. There is Chol of Israel and there is not Chol of Israel. The difference is one is a different kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, but it's, it's just a, a, a different, it's different. So to make an effort and each little effort makes a difference. Yeah. True. Very special. Very, uh, very powerful. Now it's a different type of Masira Snefesh when you're in that situation. The self-sacrifice can shine from the situation, but to, to remember that and then to, in our situations, also use that quality of self-sacrifice for, for our challenges that are obviously very different, but there's still challenges. There's still challenges. We're definitely challenged. But to, to hang on to that, that to your to the roots of that mysterious damage of that self sacrifice. It's very beautiful, very powerful. And tonight is Tess Kislev, which means the energy of the Mitchell Rebbe is shining. So it's a very, very beautiful night to learn Tanya, because of course the Mitchell Rebbe says that if he his blood, his life energies was was Hasidus. That's what his whole being was, absolutely. So it was very special to be able to, on the middle of his night, learn Hasidus, learn the Tanya. And I'm sure that's a Nachas Ruach. And I'm sure his energy is also in this world, as we know, the middle of Rebbe embodied in a physical way the perfection of the Tzaddik, that his birth and his passing are on the same day. So he was born on the ninth of Kislev and passed away 54 years later, I believe, on the ninth of Kislev. Um, and we know that on the day of a tzaddik's passing is when all of his energies are shining in this world. All, of, all that he accomplished and that every year has been stronger and stronger and stronger as there's a constant ascent. All of them are shining now in this world. Poyal Yeshua's Bekera Faretz and bringing salvation. So we should try to utilize the energy and turn. And say, okay, you know. <laughs> This has been such a tough year for us, right? We've gone through so much. We're still, these are the birth pangs of Mashiach, and boy, are they intense. And then just, just 
we should all just, that's it, pretty much yes now. Um, does someone have uh, something they'd like to share? We always like to also bring in uh, personal miracles or some, some place where you've seen Hashem shining at you this week. Someone has something they saw this week that made them feel Hashem's presence in their life. Could be small. Daddy? Thank you. So, um, uh, for, uh, for 18 years, I had been working at a uh, senior citizen home. And um, one of my, um, and I eventually became manager, but one of my residents passed away from the COVID. And, um, and I, I haven't really been at my work since March. And I'm, I'm, I'm not the manager anymore. But um, this lady was 103. And I told her niece, who was her surviving relative, that if anything happened to her, that she should let me know. And so I received a message that she had passed away. And um, the niece asked me to please speak at her Zoom memorial. And um, this lady, she wasn't Jewish, but, but she loved Jewishness very much. And um, uh, I, 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 I spoke of her because she was an incredibly wonderful spirit. She, was, she uplifted everyone around her and she loved Jews. And um, uh, it, 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 it's just, we're reminded of this time where there's this horrible sense of loss where people are, unfortunately, they're leaving us, even if they're 103, they're leaving us, people that have had full lives, people that haven't had full lives. And I could not do, I could not do my job. I could not take care of 24 people without, um, without the Hasidus, without the Torah, without, never in a million years, I, I could ever, ever have handled this job, which I'm now separated from. But um, uh, your, your, your teaching uh, gives us fuel to handle life's challenges and to, with a chin up. And uh, so at this moral, I had to represent, you know, uh, the whole group because everyone loved her. Uh, but I, I'm going to tell you, I, I I can't, I could never do it without without um, without being connected and feeling it was it was shlichus uh, because that wasn't wasn't my dream. I was a cook. I was in a rock and roll band. I did all this stuff and my other before I became observant. You know, I was all this stuff going on. But um, anyways, I I just want to thank you, Cyril, for for connecting, uh, you know, your flock here in Chicago and elsewhere to um so they can fulfill their potential and um and i saw that 21 25 years 25 years ago i was a dorm mother and i saw what you did with these kids they were they just blossomed from little wallflowers to giants so um uh so anyways i just i just want to thank you because I, I can't do what i do without without leaders like you that that, that guide us and help us along Thank you. Thank you. We should always see how the Hasidus is helping us and giving us the strength to do what we're supposed to do in this world. In, in the rock band or in the kitchen or in the resident home, in all of those ways that each one of us is a shleach. There's a, everywhere you turn, every Jew is Hashem's emissary and we, we need the strength of Tyra to be able to do what he wants from us. He wants a lot. He wants a lot. And, and Hasidus helps. Thank you very much for sharing that. That was very, very beautiful. Does someone else have something they'd want to share? Something else that happened this week? Even a, I have a little Mifsayim, mm -hmm. little Mifsayim story. So, um, we just, you know, you just have to sometimes just try. You don't know, like it's Kislev and I wanted to just, okay, well, I don't know where we're going to, we can't go to Jewel now because 
you know, they don't let us stand there because of the COVID. And so whatever. Um, so uh, Michael Elkin said, do you want to go? Oh, so we just went, we said, okay, where are we going? We went to Old Orchard. And we said, whoever we'll meet is going to be, you know, Hashkach or Pratis. There's, there's a reason. But what I found that was inspiring is that they usually, you know, you would go to malls and you'd get kicked out because you're, you know, you're soliciting or proselytizing, whatever they call, but it was interesting. We were at, in the, um, we're looking for Jews and we asked like a worker there and they said, oh, like the, it was a couple of times, like the non-Jews were trying so hard to help us find Jews. Like they just were like, they're there to help us to just, to, um, to do the Mufsayam. I mean, it, it's just like an interesting thing, that shift of the world. Like the, the non-Jews want to help. And I think even what, you know, the idea that sh to speak, that they wanted to hear from a Jew to, because we really are, you know, godly people and, and they feel it. And it's like, here we are at this time to embrace that. I think it's kind of miraculous, that shift, that's all. It is, it is, you're right. It's a very, very, very clear sign. It was very special, this, uh, this last, uh, Musa Shabbos is my share to um, Benos Noach. And there were, there were two, well, three, but really let's say two new women on the class. We just started doing it on Zoom, so it's great. We can see the faces. And I asked the first woman, where are you from? Like, you know, I don't know, what's your name? Your name I see on the screen, where are you from? She said, Kenya. And I was like thinking, wow, imagine right now in Kenya, here's this woman in Kenya, Africa, and she's, she's, she's wanting God. And she was totally invested and had great insight, asked great questions. And the other woman said she's from some... I didn't even catch it. Some small country in like sub-Saharan Africa. But since then, she's moved and she's in Evanston, Illinois. I'm like, wow, you're my neighbor. You know, this one's in Kenya. You're in Evanston. But it was just it was just such a feeling, like you're saying, of this transformation of the world. That, 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 that people in Kenya can be turning to God and, and serving him. It's unbelievable. So you're absolutely right. Very, very, very powerful movement toward Mashiach. Very powerful. And um, someone else? I want to say about Broha's mother. She uh, once, uh, it was someone's husband, I guess uh, someone's Broha from Broha's children. And she was, she was there and Broha asked me to speak to her in Russian. And she was so delighted. She was so warm warmed by by the by, by the Russian language. I spoke to her a little bit and it was such a machai to see this generation. She was such a special woman. Special. You could see by her daughter how special her mother was. Yeah, a lot of the things Bracha was saying, I was like thinking, aha, uh -huh, okay. So now we know where it comes from. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it came from both parents. I'm sure from both. Sure, from both. Good of both, Baruch Hashem. But yeah, that's so nice. Wow. So it was both, you were doing a favor for her and she did a favor for you. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, we spoke. We spoke. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. And, you know, all the big deals and the details and all the little details, just always seeing Hashem. I have uh, now the... I don't think I'd really call it pleasure, but whatever that um, Beryl's afternoon program is uh, at home virtual because some some in the staff had COVID. I mean, nobody has it now, but they're still virtual. It's been like two and a half weeks, which is it's just really, you know, a lot because from one to five, I'm like with him trying to get him to do these therapies. And it's sometimes really challenging. I mean, you know, a child and therapy and a computer screen. And I literally find myself like dominating to Hashem, like, please, you know, I'm already taking all these hours of my life. At least I want to be able to do it. Otherwise, this is really, and then I tell myself, you know, Bittal, this is exactly what Hashem wants, because this is what you're doing. This is exactly what Hashem wants. This is how he wants you to spend your time now. 
but I, I definitely have over these days just dove into Hashem to get him to do it. And then, like, you know, there's a psicha, something happens, and, and he starts actually doing the work. So I'm, I'm always grateful to Hashem in all, in all those moments of thank you for coming through. If I'm already taking the time, thank you that he's also functioning and, and actually gaining from, from these moments. So in all the big and in all the little, there's Hashem there in our life. And um, I didn't bring the Sefer, but this week, Vayetze, uh, in the Devar Malchus of this week, which of course is, is speaking a lot about the Mithla Rebbe, the concept of the Mithla Rebbe, and the idea of the completion, that his birth and passing are on the same day, we said the Mithla Rebbe's energy is, is pure Hasidus. And I, I think this is actually one of the longest, if not, I think this is the longest Sicha of the Sicha of Nun Aleph and Nebes in 1991, 92. And I remember when I was learning and thinking, it's like it's reflecting the Mitchell Rebbe's energy. His Hasidus was so long. You know, Myra by his could be 150 pages. How his Hasidim were able to listen, let alone to process and understand a Mimer that prints has 150 large pages, I have no clue. But I, okay, so it's reflected in our world instead of the Sicha being, I don't know, 14 sections, I don't remember how many it is, but it's a few more than, than the norm. And also for that same reason, I guess, the Mitchell Rebbe's energy, it's really focused on learning on Tyra, and on how that's really the road, even now we can already access these Mashiach energies through learning Tyra, through innovating in Tyra, and, and the transformation of the evil through Tyra, that traditionally we weren't able to do it, but now we can learn and transform. So we should be Zaycha to be with, take something from Bracha's mother, Harness these energies of tonight of the Mitzvah Rebbe. I'm sure this is Aliyah for for Shimon as well, absolutely. And the story I said about her should also be an Aliyah for her neshama. And this whole class should be an Aliyah for her neshama. And we should have a wonderful week and meet in Yerushalayim. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.